Hello, uh, my name is Gavin Bailey. I'm the head of business development here at uh, AIM Sun um, and my colleague uh, Carlos. Um. Yeah, Bob. Hi, everyone. I'm Carlos Sillera. I'm the regional head of professional services in the UK for AIM Sun. So, uh, in this webinar, we hope to kind of take you through our understanding and our um, experience of the kind of true value of artificial intelligence for transport, drawing on some of the examples and applications of our solution, our artificial intelligence solutions in the sector, um, kind of drawing out case, uh, drawing on case studies, highlighting some of the limitations of um, AI techniques and how those can be filled in. So as I said, uh, just a very brief overview, we're going to cover off uh, what it what AI and transport means, starting off with a, just a very quick kind of um, very high level, what is artificial intelligence, um, drawing on case studies, covering off some of the limitations and how we actually address some of these limitations with our solutions and applications, and then how and where to begin your journey into um, artificial intelligence and simulation for transport. So just to kick off, uh, what is AI on transport? Well, to before we answer that, um, it's probably appropriate to talk about what AI is in the first play case. So artificial intelligence is a uh, field of computer science that uses methods and software which enable machines to perceive their environment and learn. When we talk about perceiving in a, their environment and learning, we're generally talking about training artificial intelligence on large data sets uh to um uh to identify trends and solve large complex problems and predict outcomes from uh from data these uh kind of methods and software they can be applied to a lot of uh tasks which are generally performed by humans but they can also be um uh, where their true value comes in is actually performing those tasks at high speed and also um to tasks which would take a human being or a group of human beings uh, weeks, months, years to actually uh, solve uh, the problems and actually extract meaningful insights. So what it actually does is it unlocks the value of what uh, we call kind of big data in that big data has a value, but its inherent value is actually how quick, uh, whether you can extract meaningful insights in a timely manner with which they're whereby they're still relevant and you can actually kind of use that information to uh, make decisions and uh, enhance outcomes. Now, there's a lot in uh, the media at the moment about artificial intelligence and a lot of the uh, artificial intelligence, which the news and media tend to refer to at the moment is generative AI, which is a newer form of artificial intelligence. But there's a massive spectrum of artificial intelligence techniques and solutions out there at the moment, some of which have been around for decades. Um, so we're going to talk just here, going to talk about two types of um, AI on this slide. The first is traditional machine learning, which is a subset of AI which uses algorithms to analyze data, learn from it and make informed decisions or predictions. So it's similar in a way to teaching a child to, for example, recognize a dog um, so you show them various pictures of dogs until you let uh, they learn to identify them correctly. So traditional machine learning is focused on analyzing data to find patterns and make accurate predictions from um, large data sets. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got generative AI, which uh, is focused on creating new data that resembles the data, the training data, what we call training data, um, that it is given. So this unlocks the ability to use other kind of AI uh, uh, techniques like, like large language models to generate new content from prompts. So this is uh, things like chat GPT, um, where you can give it an instruction to say, uh, write me a sonnet in the style of Shakespeare. It will draw on the contextual information within that prompt, like write a sonnet, um, in the style of and and that it needs to be in the style of Shakespeare, and then it will produce new material. It will make up data um, based on that prompt, and that's the key thing here: is that um, generative AI is actually used to create brand new material. Um, when we're talking, uh, it, 
it's worth mentioning for the context of this kind of presentation, we're actually talking about traditional machine learning techniques. There are generative AI techniques that are being applied to transport, but they're very, very new and some of which we're working on. But today's presentation focuses on traditional machine learning. And so I'll pass over to Carlos for the Thank next you. slides. Thank you, Gavin. So during uh, this presentation, we're going to show different use cases on how we have applied these machine learning models. Uh, the first component we're going to show is uh, the AIMS Insights component. There is a historical data set analysis. And these are some of the use cases we have used um, these machine learning models, you know, where we can find, for example, the identification of recurrent patterns on, on the network, uh, performance analysis of delays or past journey times within a region, city or town, or air quality assessments, electric vehicle, charging infrastructure, etc. No? In the next slide, we can go into a bit more detail on one of these use cases uh, that will be very uh, self-explanatory. No? We're going to show an example of Amazon Insights uh, within the Sydney M4 deployment. Uh, there is an Amazon Live deployment, but as part of an Amazon Live, we do also data insights you know which uh, what is the quality that we, uh, the quality of the data that we are going to use and the very first steps that we do is what we can see on the left no we receive a bunch of historical data sets from different data sources containing multiple different variables and the first thing we have to do is to normalize so the data can be read by our by our machine learning algorithms so once we have the data normalized this data can be analyzed and the first graphs or um, insights that we can provide is what we saw on the left, no? Uh, heat maps or also information that can be brought in a map that tell us how accurate the data that we have is. If you go one back one second, Gavin, this is how the data set, for example, for the Sydney M4, there is a combination of 2,000 scan detectors and 1,000 motorway detectors within the M4. This is the accuracy over one year of the data. So we can see Picks, uh, well, picks, uh, black spots, that means that there is no data, or red dots, red spots that represent that the data is not accurate, or we have been receiving faulty data during a period of time. And on the next image, we can see how these can be cleaned with the help of machine learning models, and we can enhance existing data sets, standardizing them across the whole uh, period of analysis. Once the data has been cleaned, we can then run the pattern generation analysis. There is a clustering of we can create different, we can identify different clusters within this region. And for example, in the case of the M4, we have found, for example, eight different traffic profiles that we can see on the left with the flow that represents the most recurrent traffic conditions within the M4. We can see the profile on the left. On the right, we can see a calendar that is self-explanatory as well, where we find in vertical each days of the week from Monday to Sunday and in horizontal every single week from November 2021 to December 2022. And, and well, we can observe different Friday, uh, Friday pattern in orange, Saturday, Sundays, but also different work days in blue and, and, and brown or Christmas as well that has been identified in purple and pink January 2022 that was different than the other types of, of work days. No? So this information is information that we can get by looking at the historical data sets, and then this can inform the local authority about the quality of the existing data sets within the region, but also it can help us on the calibration and validation of any model when we go back into the modeling uh, aspect. Now in the next slide, we can see different use, case, uh, use cases in real-time environment. So with all the historical data sets that we showed before, we can learn how this region, city, town behave, how the data sets, which kind of information they provide. So once we have ingested sufficient data, we can then understand how the city performs and be able to carry out some predictions. No, Predictions about trouble times, predictions about flows, also predictions about potential incidents happening on the network and also the detection of incidents occurring on the network. Because if we see that the real-time data doesn't match with any of the predictions that our machine learning models are saying, that would mean that we would be in front of an incident occurring in real time in the network. No. In the next slide, we have a, uh, an example deployment in, in the C32 that's in Catalonia, uh, close to Barcelona. That's a corridor that, where we have 
real-time information at loop detector, providing flow and speed. And also we have real-time information from floating car data at section level that allow us to, for example, as we can see here, carry out some predictions of how the speeds are going to look like uh, for the next hour. Being able to identify areas that are going to be congested and also being able as well to identify incidents in real time with a very short uh, notice. No? So the traffic operators can be quickly and aware of what's happening in the network and react accordingly. Uh, here is why what we, what we are showing is that these predictions are constantly being evaluated and reviewed. So essentially when we run a prediction of one hour, once this hour has been completed in real time, we can compare what the prediction said against uh, the real data and continuously learning and, um, uh, and continuously learning about the data and, and, and the area that we are assessing. In the next slide, we have an example of the incident detection model in one of the first deployments we ran in the UK. And this is a very clear example of what the incident detection model can provide. No? On the left, we have a circle with a warning uh, and also Teams message on top that we used uh, back then, but this is still a system that is up and running, to identify things, anomalies happening on the network. No? In the example that we show on the left, the top graph actually represents this flow uh, drop at 6.40 in the morning that is associated with this incident we detected. No? And because the real-time traffic, it's not in the similar order of magnitude as the predictions, we raised this alarm into the UI of this system as well as Teams, so the traffic operators can be immediately informed about this anomaly happening in the network. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Um, so hopefully there you've got a flavor of some of the applications that artificial intelligence can be um, kind of put to both in kind of historical and real time, but it's worth uh, kind of talking about some of the limitations that uh, these techniques have. Um, it's worth noting, we've said this a couple of times already, that they require large sensor sets of relevant data and it needs to be continuous data as well. So you're talking about um, traffic detection from in-road loops or uh, cameras employing uh, computer vision based um, artificial intelligence to detect and characterize uh, and classify traffic. Um, the larger the data set, the better, really, because it helps smooth out or make the uh, the AI less sensitive to errors and factors um, which are irrelevant or might generate spurious results. So if you have a, it's like with anything, if you have a small data set and then you perform a statistical analysis on it, any anomalies within that data um, are going to represent a larger proportion of the overall population and thereby affect the outcome. The same is true for artificial intelligence, which is why we uh, typically use big data sets to, uh, to train them. Uh, artificial intelligence is also only really suitable for areas or locations or things which you have measured and you've observed. It can't predict things or give you in insights for areas of your road network which for which you have no contextual data whatsoever. It's worth saying that you can interpolate um, kind of uh, traffic counts, things like traffic counts and, and flow of vehicles along areas which are in between lots of count points, but the um, the speed or uh, the, the the way that this uh, the traffic moves through the system to get to those points um, will be kind of uh, that information will still be absent. And similarly, you can't uh, whilst it can detect incidents, it can't predict its impacts. It can predict how the flow might change, but it won't. It can't predict how um, that flow might uh, the the change in flow might propagate throughout a network, thereby. To, uh, kind of giving you information on how the congestion might um, might develop throughout the network. And similarly, uh, it goes again with it can't really predict things that it hasn't observed. You, it's difficult to apply these techniques to non-recurrent events. So we're typically looking at applying this to areas where you have observed, you are observing kind of recurrent um, events or situations or scenarios on a road network. Um, and then it can predict with uh, kind of stati statistical probability whether that event is going to occur again, when it might occur, but it can't um, predict an event that has never occurred and that it hasn't seen. 
There are ways that we can um, enhance and augment uh, AI though, and that we do that um, using simulation, which we're going to talk about now. So by combining simulation with artificial intelligence, you can start to fill in the gaps between count, count points with a greater kind of accuracy and uh, contextual awareness. So if you know what the traffic flows look like at count points, and then you bring in the physical characteristics of connecting links and driving behaviors, you can begin to estimate traffic behaviors and interactions across a network. So this can provide a richer and more dynamic understanding of how tra of traffic on the network at any given time using that artificial intelligence and the simulation of the traffic in the network. You can begin to quantify um, metrics which haven't been measured, such as emissions. So you, we can do that by typically do that by combining the simulated traffic data with emissions models and coefficients so that you can start to determine the environmental impacts of uh, your traffic on your network. And you can begin to predict how traffic moving through the system might evolve and therefore how the network might perform. So you can actually start to bring in things like decision support um, tools and start to actually understand um, or proactively uh, kind of manage the network based on its predicted, um, predicted traffic state. And that's one of the really powerful things that simulation and AI does, is it can actually give um, transport managers a, the ability to evaluate their actions and make better informed decisions. All of these kind of features around AI and simulation actually enable what we call traffic digital twins. Um, just to introduce another kind of uh, piece of jargon. So to so very quickly kind of address that, um, what is a traffic digital twin? Well, they're digital replicas of a road, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure connected to real world sensors and automatic traffic counters. And that can be things like scoot, mover detectors, uh, your in-road induction loops, uh, computer vision based traffic detection, like uh, using dedicated cameras, uh, like Viva City cameras or other um, technologies and CCTV. Uh, we can also pull in mobile phone data and in-car data, but one of the issues that we have with that kind of data is that it doesn't capture 100% of the population. And when you're talking about managing a transport network, you need to capture near to 100% or as much of the traffic moving through a road link as you can. And the top two kind of technologies there are really the, the ones that do that. In terms of scale, these can be applied at a junction or a single road level or the, um, all the way up to city, regional and national scale. So they're fairly adaptable and they're actually a fairly dynamic tool that can be applied to a whole host of, uh, of, of uh, situations. They enable the simulation of real world traffic conditions in real time. So with this, you can actually track vehicles through a network as they're moving and they're uh, kind of detected as they're detected through the network. And you can also simulate what that traffic might is likely to do up to an hour in advance. And our, our kind of uh, digital twin, which is Amazon Live, uh, can do that with about 65 to 70% uh, accuracy. And then, as I said previously, these digital twins then enable, provide a feedback to the real world via decision support for human users and automated response and um, uh, via automated responses when connected to a UTMC system like Unix's uh, systems. So you can actually fully close the loop and you can pull in real data um, in real time, process it, add some intelligence and some um, information, provide some decision support and then actuate change on the network. So it's a little bit like a modern form of the Ita Italian job. In terms of Aim Sun Life, uh, so as I said, digital twins are a very diverse tool and it's important to think of them as a tool. They're not a uh, kind of single application or single software solution. They are a tool which can be applied to a multitude of uh, situations um, achieving kind of countless outcomes. Um, it's really how you want to under, it's really about how you, what problem you have and um, what you need to fix. Amazon Live, which is our digital twin technology, has been successfully applied to uh, real-time operational management of networks to help operators um, proactively identify traffic conditions before they unfold 
um, and then manage them. Um, we kind of put in proactive measures to manage those and mitigate any congestion, unwanted congestion. They've been used to evaluate the impact of congestion management strategies, and that comes into that decision support element. So um, when a traffic manager comes to a uh, uh, to manage a incident on the network or congestion, uh, they can model out a number of plan uh, management strategies and then simulate the actual potent expected impact of those based on the predicted traffic flows and then ident very quickly identify um, which is the most appropriate strategy to use, either using visual information on maps or KPR, pre-coded KPIs, which we've got an example of on the screen. They can be used to, uh, and finally, this kind of feeds into what Carlos was saying, that because they're connected to real-time data, they can track the progress of deployed strategies, continually assessing the accuracy of its predictions and also the efficacy of those actions. So there's a continuous cycle of improvement that goes on with this system. Um, I'm going to hand over to Carlos to talk about some of the uh, case studies. Yep. So as we did before with insights and and predict, uh, we have the, we can also describe some of the uh, use cases that we have used the most um, for uh, our digital twin. There are other cases that are not here and always can be proposed depending on the end goal of the um, area that we're going to sense with the local authority. But as you mentioned, Gavin, one of the most used cases is for um, supporting uh, the uh, traffic operators in decision support. Uh, you know? So in front of an incident or an anomaly occurring on the network, um, we can run multiple simulations of different what if scenarios. So what if I divert traffic that way or if I change signal timings in this corridor to promote traffic uh, flows in case that one lane is blocked to an incident. But aims for life can also be used uh, for uh, dynamic tolling systems so we can assess the impact of different uh, toll prices and how this will affect the rerouting in, in real time or um, as well uh, predict based on the predicted flows of our solution uh, optimize or propose the optimized signal timings for for the the area of of study i'm going to do a little demo in a while once uh, we finish this this chapter that we will see a new use case um, with a real demo but before that um, on the next slide we can see some of the use cases that we have AIMS for Life. Uh, likely, this slide will need to be updated because we are working in some AIMS for Life at this moment, uh, at least three or four that are not here. But these are some of the, the AIMS for Life that has been um, completely um, deployed and handover so they can be used uh, to support traffic operators in all these cities. Um, Showing on the next slide, we can see a brief description of some of them. Um, I'm going to show. I'm going to do the demo of of the Oxfordshire that originally was for air quality and and traffic management, but we also have here an iconic game so live in Bergen that was done for tunnel management. Essentially, Bergen uh, is a city where you can access through different tunnels. Uh, there are three major tunnels that you can use to access the the Bergen uh, uh, city center, and the traffic operator wanted to have a system where they can see in case of closing one of them because of a maintenance um, a reason or due to an incident occurring on one of them, if they have to shut one of these tunnels, what would be the impact and the different uh, options to divert traffic across the different tunnels? No? In the next slide, we have even more deployments. Uh, some of them, the most iconic, I would say, Sydney and Ford and San Diego, that San Diego was the first intro life um, ever deployed, where we have... Um, um, corridor management, uh, so the traffic operators can assess how, uh, can monitor how the detection in the system and the whole corridor is working in real time, but also uh, again, they have the option of testing different alternatives in case uh, they have a performance issue or an incident happening in, in the network. So back to you, Gavin, so you can finish with the yeah. MSO Live, and then I will go back to an, an MSO Live demo. So uh, just to cover off a couple of the uh, deployments which we've recently been working on in the UK, uh, we announced earlier this year that uh, we have begun uh, development of the of a Ameson Live system in Tees Valley Combined Authority. Um, this covers the entirety of uh, the Combined Authority um, uh, region and all of its uh, its transport network. 
this system actually uh, deploys our instant detection system, which uh, Carlos um, uh, talked about earlier. And it also uh, deploys a bus reliability improvement module, which works in a very similar way to um, to the incident detection system in that it is connected to live bus data and uh, it can track the bus at the movement of the buses through the network and it compares the location of the bus to where it should be on a, um, according to the bus timetable. With that data it can identify whether a bus is on time or not. It can also identify potentially whether a bus is likely to become uh, late based on its simulated movement through the network. Once it's identified a late bus or a potentially late bus, it can then simulate a number of uh, mitigation strategies or uh, kind of management strategies to try and get that bus back on time. And the unique thing with this solution is it actually looks at a full corridor. So rather than just looking at traffic light by traffic light priority, where the bus comes along, pings the traffic light and says I'm late and it's given a green light or it's given a green wave through signals, this solution can uh, look at the late bus and then it can model out um, a number of strategies, pre-coded strategies to identify the best strategy to get that bus back on time, whilst also um, assessing the potential impacts of that priority strategy on the wider network. Uh, and that can include other cars, other, um, other network users, and also importantly, other buses that intersect with that corridor, which might be penalised by the priority of the late bus, uh, given to the late bus. Once it's identified the most appropriate action, uh, once it's simulated those actions, it then tests those against KPI, pre-established KPIs, and can uh, to then identify the best solution. And then the best solution can be communicated to traffic operator via a Teams message, or automatically via the UTMC system. The critical thing here with the decision support engine in this case is that it can actually help operators identify whether a do nothing scenario is actually preferable to a do something scenario because the do something scenario could actually yield congest unwanted congestion on the network that leads to delay to other buses, other network, significant delay to other um, network users and actually might then cause the bus to be delayed even further. It might actually undo what we're trying to uh, have the opposite effect. The uh, other uh, AIMS on Life that we've got in the UK, um, which we've just gone through a refresh, which Carlos will uh, give a demonstration of in a, in a moment, is the Oxford Nevma model. Now, this was deployed back in 2018, 2019, and this pulled on network data, traffic, um, traffic patterns, and also air quality data. And the object of this uh, system was to identify traffic states on the network which coincided with air quality exceedances or expected air quality exceedances and then manage that traffic in order to mitigate against the occurrence of those air quality exceedances. Uh, with it, what it did here is it would identify a potential air quality uh, kind of pollution event and it would model the dispersion of that pollution over the network, identify the areas of the network which it needed to manage, and then it enabled traffic managers to either speed traffic through the problem area with green waves or divert the tra uh, some traffic to other areas which could accommodate a small increase in, in um, air pollution. What this uh, model did is it actually successfully, now it wasn't, it's important to note, it was um, a research project funded by Innovate UK and done in undertaken in collaboration with National Highways. So there wasn't actually any real world implementation, but um, the model actually identified the opportunity to mitigate against air quality exceedances on 65% of days when there would have otherwise been an air quality exceedance. So it actually had a fairly significant impact on the potential emissions that would have been experienced in that uh, in the areas where it was deployed. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Carlos now to uh, give you a bit of a live demo of the uh, Oxford model. Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know when you can yep. see. Yeah, so always always before uh, showing an AIMS for life, and then I always go to the AIMS for next model that we build. Uh, essentially, because you can see the core of the AIMS for life 
and, and this model that sits under, no? A model where we can ingest or we can, in, yeah, we can inject some of the data insights, like the patterns that we saw or the uh, data availability for each one of the data sources that we use. And it's the model that runs the different simulations um, in real time, but also it can be used for uh, offline uh, assessments and, and uh, strategic and operational modeling purposes. So now let's go back to the live environment and that's how the live environment looks like. So the first component that we have is the monitoring where we can see all the available data sources of this Oxford deployment. So just to briefly summarize on that one, we have three different um, detection data points uh, from OCC and ATC detectors, national highways loop detectors, and we also have Viva City cameras. We are receiving real time information from all these three data sources. And one of the first things we can provide is well, with the monitoring component, we can see which detectors are working, which ones are not working, how the data looks like, and also some very high level indicators of well, what's the flow over capacity ratio for each one of these points. So we can have an idea of the areas that are more congested. We can also run some predictions um, for a, each one of the points that it's essentially now it's 1130 in Oxford. We can predict how the traffic flows through the A34 are going to be because we have learned from the historical data and we have applied these machine learning models that are part of an Amazon predict deployment. And this could be feeding an AMSO life, an AMSO life system that could use this information to adjust the simulation matrices as well. Uh, the AMSO life is um, important as well because we have uh, simulation based predictions. So what we see right now is the network and the prediction of traffic of flow over capacity for the next hour. So we can identify as well not only which regions are more, more congestion right now by looking at the data, but also which regions are going to be more congested in the hour ahead according to our predictions. No? Predictions are, are completely different for every day because every day is different. And it could be different because the demand has changed or because the supply is different and there are some roadworks or incidents occurring in the network. So with this monitoring and prediction component that is very accurate for the traffic day, uh, for the day, uh, Typical the conditions of today, especially, we can run the decision support component. No? So an example would be that the traffic operator can identify issues occurring on one of the entrances of the Oxford City Centre, and they have uh, a tool uh, that is decision support tool within Amazon Live where they can request, for example, I want to mitigate congestion going into uh, Oxford. CBD, and we have different predefined um, response plan scenarios uh, that we can test and see the impact of them along as the do nothing scenario. For example, what I'm running right now are uh, different options to access the city center. It's going to take a while, it's going to take 60, 90 seconds to load, but I can probably go to another use case I ran a couple of days ago. So essentially, the response plans can assess what is the what's the difference if we have vehicles on the A34 going into the city center, going through the north approach, or taking Bodley Road on the west, uh, and how this VMS message could deviate traffic, and and see what is the best uh, action to do. Do nothing on the top left, do something deviate them through the north approach, or uh, divert them through Bodley Road. They have different KPIs to assess the results with multi-mapping options as well, to the, so they can see the graphs and the density uh, flow predictions. But also we can have also some predefined KPIs. In this case, it's very simple. We only have flow and congestion indicators, but we can go into more detail and include the environmental uh, KPIs. We can also include journey time KPIs. Uh, so they will be able to pick the best uh, decision and the best response plan to mitigate one specific incident happening today. So back to you, Gavin. Well, thank you very much, guys. All right, so um, hopefully we've given you kind of a bit of a flavour of uh, some of the applications of artificial intelligence in transport and also how simulation can help to address some of the gaps and actually enhance uh, the applications of artificial intelligence in transport. Um, now I'm just going to focus on, this is kind of drawing on 
our experience and our work with other clients in terms of um, where to begin in um, AI and simulation and um, how to go about it because digital twins, uh, traffic digital twins or artificial intelligence techniques, they're still very, as we said, they can be applied to a broad re range of problems. So it's, uh, it's kind of important not to think these are the only applications that um, these tools or technologies can be applied to. It's not relevant to me. You've got a bit of a kind of discovery process to go through um, to understand how they uh, how these technologies and solutions fit uh, might fit for you. Um, so the key thing that we uh, kind of work on um, in this area is identifying what we call your pain points. And this is at the heart of your understanding of functional requirements. So what outcomes are you or um, uh, those that are working with seeking and what do they need to achieve um, and what are their barriers to success? So it's in many cases when talking to, um, to clients, they'll know what their problem is and they'll know what they need to do to solve it. But there's that kind of thing of why have that question of okay so you know what the solution is why why haven't you solved it and that's their bar that's the barrier that's the the kind of pain point um which you then need to develop a pain reliever to and that's ultimately the pain reliever is ultimately the solution <coughs> the uh the the art the application of the artificial intelligence technique or um the uh, traffic digital twin it's also understanding things which so pain relievers are things which people need that they can't get. Um, but then on the flip side, there's also understanding what they need, but they don't want, which we call game creators. And that's things which they don't. Uh, Apple, to use a kind of pop culture example, Apple is very good at this, at creating um, game, create, uh, at marketing and developing game creators. It's developing something which society didn't realize they needed and then once they've got it they can't figure out how they lived without it that's the game creator so it's trying to identify those are more difficult to identify but it's um it's identifying those as well to then deliver some significant outcomes and in, and kind of um real value added to people so the first thing is really understanding the fundamentals of what you actually want to achieve how you would achieve it and what the barriers are to achieving that and that informs the fundamental design and architecture of the solution once you've done that it's all very well saying we know that we need a digital twin or we know that we need to employ xyz um, artificial intelligence techniques but then you've got the feasibility element of can you actually do that this is going playing to the these kind of identifying a solution is an iterative process. It's not something which can be pres um, highly prescribed from the start. This is a um, kind of discovery process of this is my problem. This is how I'll solve it. Isn't the proposed solution um, feasible or not with what I've got? And then kind of going through, can I fill in the gaps? Yes or no? No. OK, we need to go back to the drawing board. So once you've identified the solution, then it's important to investigate, um, particularly with an artificial intelligence solution, data, um, understanding what you have, how much you have and what the quality of that data is. All of those three points will affect the outcomes and the fidelity of your, um, the final solution. Um, and as Carlos kind of alluded to earlier, this is why we start with Aimstone Insights when we're doing any kind of artificial intelligence um, solution is we actually first say, this is what we propose. Let's have a look at your data and see what the data looks like. Can we enhance it using artificial in te um, intelligence techniques? What else do we need? If we can't quite get there, what's the gap? Can we fill that with additional technologies? So in some cases in the transport field, specifically around traffic data, we'd be talking about deploying new computer vision um, cameras or detection infrastructure to fill in um, data gaps. Once you've understood that and then you've refined the final solution, then if you're uh, the supplier or you're the client, um, you need to understand what the procurement route is. Now, this can arguably be done in parallel with um, identifying the pain points because it's something which um, 
uh, it's it's not dependent on understanding a solution. When we talk about procurement route, we're talking about how you're going to actually award, uh, you know, if you're taking time to work with a supplier as a, if you're a local authority and if you're a supplier working with a, uh, with an authority or, a, or any kind of private sector client, there's an investment that's going, that's being made here in understanding and identifying the solution to your, to a problem. Um, so it's important to recognise that if there's a need for direct procurement, which does foster um, the, the the National Infrastructure Commission has uh, recently reported this in their um, in one of their reports that direct uh, competitive procurement routes do not tend to foster innovation because it foster, it tends to engender kind of a race to the bottom. Um, direct procurement routes, which enable that iterative collaborative process between a client and um, supplier. Um, typically will, um, are likely to yield kind of more desirable or um, intended outcomes from the process. And when building out that procurement route, uh, the procurement, you need to then build out the specification as part of that collaborative process. So agree upon final functionality and timescales price, enshrine the really important thing, and this is enshrining KPIs um, into the design of a system so that you can measure um, how well it's performing and whether it's achieving the outcomes. That's really important when you're talking about any kind of artificial intelligence solution and any kind of uh, traffic digital twin. We have fallen foul in the early days to deploying traffic digital twins, which didn't have these KPIs baked in, um, which then mean when it comes to evidencing the imp their impact and the outcomes from the system, it's actually quite difficult. And there's a significant amount of kind of um, uh, retrospective coding and, and design um, in order to do that. But once you've done that, once you've moved through all of this, then you can develop um, the system, deploy it, and then you move to monitor and evaluate it. As Carlos said, one of the kind of really key benefits of um, these systems, artificial intelligence systems and traffic digital twins is because they're hooked into real-time data, you get that continuous and instant, almost instantaneous monitoring and evaluation. So you can assess the impacts as you go and then improve the, suit, the solution without having to wait. In terms of uh, this whole collaborative process, really depends on how motivated people are. Um, we, in working with clients, have um, gone from conception of a idea to, uh, to delivery in a couple months. Uh, with some authorities and clients, it goes to a year or a year and a half, depending on the size of the solution. It's one thing to really bear in mind when you're thinking about the size of the problem, really be try to be realistic about how big a problem that is um, and be hypercritical of yourself as to how your perception of how big that problem is, um, because we all have a tendency to overinflate or underinflate um, the, uh, the scale of a problem, um, which can really kind of uh, hamper the whole process of developing a solution and deploying it. Um, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have.